everyone. We wanted to tell you about a new show we are loving, the Culture Study Podcast with Anne Helen Peterson. It's a show about exploring the nooks and crannies of the culture that surrounds you. Each week, Anne and a super smart co-host answer listeners' questions about the stuff they find interesting and perplexing, like, why do clothes suck now? Is Paw Patrol copaganda or is it not that deep? And what's the deal with everyone I know getting a divorce? Like Anne's tremendously popular newsletter, the Culture Study Podcast is funny, insightful, and kind of weird. And it's guaranteed to help you become the most interesting person at parties. Listen to the Culture Study Podcast every Wednesday, wherever you get your shows. Hello, it's Lindy and Megan from Text Me Back. If you love podcasts that feel like conversations between friends, there's another show that we think you'll love. It's called Nerdette, and it's from our friends at WBEZ in Chicago. Each Friday, host Greta Johnson helps you catch up and unwind from the week with conversations that celebrate curiosity and delight. Nerdette also has a monthly book club. And in that spirit, let's listen to a recent episode they did about the best books of the year. Get ready to find your next favorite read. From WBEZ Chicago, this is Nerdette. I'm Greta Johnson. We did it. We made it to another weekend and another year is almost coming to an end, which means now is the perfect time to sit back, relax and reflect on some of the best stuff that came out this year. Later this month, we're going to talk about the best podcasts and TV shows of 2023. But today it is all about books. And I am so excited about our guests for this one. With us today, we have Andrew Limbong. He's a reporter on NPR's Arts Desk and hosts the Book of the Day podcast. Andrew, hello. Yo, what's up? What's up? Thanks for having me. Oh my gosh. Thrilled to have you. Also here is Miwa Messer. She hosts Barnes and Noble's book podcast, Poured Over. Miwa, hello. Hi, it's so good to see you guys. Oh my gosh, what a treat. Okay, so since y'all are both like professional readers, I'm very (laughs) curious how many books you read in a given year. Like, I mean, I assume you're keeping track somehow, Andrew. Oh, let me pop up the spreadsheet. You got a spreadsheet? Amazing. Let's see. Drive. Let me not say my password. (laughs) (laughs) If you want to, it's fine. 44. 44. Yeah. 44. Okay. That's nice. What about you, Miwa? So I don't actually keep track and I don't actually no i can tell you though it's upwards of a hundred just yeah. between the show Sheesh. yeah but well here's <laughs> i also read really quickly like mm. i read frighteningly that is my weirdo superpower i read that's really helpful. really quickly and it makes my entire existence possible <laughs> <laughs> that's great that's really good Okay, so before we wait, 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 whoa, whoa, we all come on. Oh, 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 oh sorry, 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 sorry. Okay, okay. I think I'm at like 85 for this year. Yeah. Which wow, you guys read way more than I do. Is I usually have like an audiobook going and a print book going, and I used to read, oh, you know, over 100 pretty consistently, but. I met someone and we live together and I'm reading a lot less, which I think is a really good thing, actually. It's Uh like, oh, I'm living my life. That's really nice. Yeah. (laughs) Totally acceptable. (laughs) Totally, totally acceptable. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's it's good. I think it's a good thing. But yeah, I don't know. One of my resolutions last year was to read fewer books that I wasn't into because I feel Mm -hmm. like with the numbers game, sometimes it's hard. You know, it's like, no, I got to plow through. I got to like, you know, no, those. No, I am ruthless. Mm -mm. I'm ruthless. I am absolutely ruthless. I'm absolutely ruthless. I do not have time if it is not doing what I need it to do, or I can jump in somewhere in the middle and grab 30 pages or Mm, grab 20 pages at the end. Mm. There were times when like, there were years where it's like November comes and I'm just like read it like picking out novellas and like show, you know, to like to like juice the numbers like yes exactly. <laughs> like I'm sort it's of like, stock what am I doing <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah it's like who cares yeah totally mm-hmm. okay so before we get to our picks which I'm really excited to talk to y'all about I would love to know from each of you what you're looking for in like the perfect book because you know we're all different readers and I think that's mm-hmm. probably what's so exciting about a conversation like this. Miwa, like, are you a plot person? Are you a vibes person? Are you kind of all of the above? What do you think? I'm language first. Mm. And then I'm sort of vibes. If stuff happens, that's okay. (laughs) But I don't need stuff to happen to be in a book. I need to buy into the author's vision. I need to buy into the narrative voice. But if you're going to sit on a bench and tell me a story, if the writing's there, I'll sit right next to you. 
I'll be there through the whole thing. <laughs> That's so funny. I had a feeling you were going to say that. We're very different that way because I want a plot. I want shit to go down. I want to be get like, it. Oh, oh, what is happening? What mm-hmm. about you, Andrew? Are you somewhere in between? No, I'm firmly on team vibes. Like I, <laughs> I, <laughs> if I think back to all of my like, you know, favorite life changing cornerstone books yeah. there, it's mostly just like dudes walking around. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like I love I love a good walking around book. Mm-hmm. You know, you're just walking around. It's like, oh wow, okay, no, that's it. That's the plot. Uh, they walk around, and <laughs> and I'm like, oh my goodness, this is a life changing event for me. This guy walked. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, that's so funny. Well, good. I'm glad. I'm glad we get to unpack some stuff here. Um, Andrew, should we start with you? What do you want to start with? Um, I will start. Oh, this is a primo walking around book. Um, I will uh, start with uh, Landscapes uh, by Christine Lai. Um, it's about, it's kind of dystopian. It's about this woman who lives in a, in an estate in the English countryside and, and there's a bunch of art in there and she's in charge of archiving the art. The issue is that the world is like low key ending um, more than low key, just like, you know, <laughs> ending. And she's, you know, combing through these works of art that may or may not have like stuff wrong with them. Also, this estate is du- doubles as a refuge. Uh, for people who need shelter as the Mm -hmm. world sort of crumbles. And also on top of that, a man that she had a a kind of violent interaction with is coming to visit the estate in in the near future. And so it's it's written in these like diary form entries and she's just processing all of this stuff while taking care of the place and, and, you know, reckoning with like getting food together and all that stuff. Um, And and I think, like I said, walking around, (laughs) she just just walks around this hall. Um, but what I like about it is that it it really made me think about why we care about art, any sort of art, in the face of all these major things happening in the world. And and it's it's not necessarily an argument for, but it's a call for an examination of the idea of just like why do you care? And 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 the main character in this book is very interested in painting. Uh, a lot of the focus is on the uh, the 19th century painter, uh, James W. Turner. Uh, you do not have to care about Turner at all. Mm-hmm. I don't particularly care. <laughs> but she makes, she. Uh, I understand why she does, mm-hmm. you know, through her diary entries. Um, and it's, it's just, I read it, I think like it, it, over the summer and I just like haven't been able to stop thinking about it. Mm-hmm. So I read this one on your recommendation and I will say it wasn't as plotty as I would have liked. But I think the <laughs> thing that really struck me about it also is in the exploration of art also like depictions of rape and sexual violence over the course of human history is also Mm -hmm. explored in a very fascinating way in that book. And I think to your point, like it did make me want to be able to just walk around museums and look at all the different pieces that are unpacked in this one. Yeah. And especially I'm also not a big, that era of art, not, you know, so, so hot on, but yeah, it's like (laughs) the, I, I I feel the juice when she's, when she's like writing about these like gruesome, violent images that, you know, in the past, I might have been like, eh, maybe I'll come by. I'll go around on the next, <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll see it again later. <laughs> but it's like, oh, it really forces you to think about these things. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So Miwan, did you read this one too? I started it because Andrew recommended it mm. and I haven't finished it yet. But I will tell you this whole idea of art and mythology, right? Like, I want to expand the way we use the word mythology. I'm not talking about the Greek and Roman stuff that you see at the Met. I'm talking about how we tell stories about the art we create, mm. right? And I just, I love what I've read so far. I really, really think that I am going to be wild for this book. And yeah, you know what? I think a lot more happens in this book than we're giving it credit for. (laughs) That's true. That's very true. Well, I think even just the concept of archiving at the end of the world is just like so gorgeous. You know, it's making me think of that museum in um, the Emily St. John Mandel. Yes, totally. Um, the airport, Station 11, right? the airport. Uh-huh. And it's yeah. like, that's such human nature though, right? Like we're always archiving our experience. We're always trying to make sense of it. And art is one of the ways we do it. But yeah, I, like, am I a fan of Turner? I am not. Do I understand the appeal of Turner? Sure. <laughs> Honestly, that's probably a testament to the quality of the book too, though, right? It's like, oh yeah, we don't give a fuck about Turner, but we're still happy to read this book. I think it's totally. like, it means yeah. the book is like, it it holds up, you know? They have shots fired at Turner. Watch out, dude. <laughs> you know, he painted a lot of battleships, so yeah, it's not like we're stepping out of line all that much, to be perfectly honest. <laughs> okay, so Miwa, what do you think pair, might pair nicely with, with well, see, landscapes? 
I want to build off of landscapes for a second because loot, which you guys chose for the Nerdette book club yes. um, and had a great fun time with, which I totally appreciate. Loved loot to me is a really, it's one of the standouts from this year. I mean, it's a caper flick about colonialism, but it's a caper flick about mm-hmm. making of art, right? And how we value that and what it means. And, you know, you've got the folks in London who are sort of doing all sorts of cagey stuff with art. We've got Ibas. I love that kid. And I love that character. And I love watching him make his way through the world and figure out like what it means to build a piece of art, and the physicality that goes with that and the knowledge that goes with that and and the stories. Again, it always comes back to story, right? Like we tell ourselves stories about the value of objects, the value of art, the value of people. And I just, I think loot is really fun and subversive and smart. And it's really funny in unexpected ways. And like, okay, straight up, not a big historical fiction person. Like mm. I am just, and I love this book so much because of the language and the structure. Mm-hmm. And I didn't feel like I had to know huge amounts of British or French or Indian history. I just needed to care about the characters and the story. And I have enough opinions about art <laughs> and how we value it <laughs> to make this story fly for me. Like it mm. just, and like there's a book about a book thing happening in this. The women are great. The women are just fantastic. I mean, the dudes, we love them too, but the women are just, they're fantastic. <laughs> yeah, shout out dudes. <laughs> Thank you for representing dudes, Andrew. Yeah. I appreciate it. It's really good. I think, and you know, I have raved about this for like hours worth of stuff on Nerd App before, so I won't get into it too much. But I think, Miwa, if you hadn't chosen loot, I probably would have put it on my list of of three that we would talk about here. Because it's, it, I just thought it was, like it is historical fiction at its finest, which is mm-hmm. such a treat, I think, when it's really done well and you don't have to think about it too hard and you just get to enjoy it and you're learning so much. It's such a treat. And it also shows us where we are. Like, good historical fiction isn't so much about, like, yes. doing the whole time travel thing, right? Like, it's not ye olde timey languagey thing happening. It really <laughs> is, like, who are we? What are we doing? Where have we been? Where are we going? And that's what I look to books for. Yeah. So I think that transitions perfectly into one of my favorites, which is another Nerd App Book Club pick. Actually, all my three are, which I think just means it was a really good year for Mm -hmm. the book Mm -hmm. club. Um, (laughs) But I would love to rave about a book that I'm pretty sure all three of us have read, which is Lauren Groff's The Vaster Wilds. Love. Mm -hmm. Speaking of historical fiction, I think Mm -hmm. that speaks very much to our current moment in some really interesting ways too, but also... It's one of so Loot and The Vaster Wilds are the only books that I read twice this year. And mm-hmm. I just, it was such a pleasure to go back to it because, speaking of language, I mean, oh my God, it's just so rich. I think the, the thing I keep going back to about it is that reverence and appreciation of natural beauty, but the fact that it cannot coexist without also understanding the intense brutality of nature, I just think is so mm-hmm. cool. <laughs> Yeah, it's also gross. gross. <laughs> a lot of... <laughs> it's good gross. So, wow, there sure is a lot of puking in this book. Golly, golly gee. <laughs> a lot of guts being spilled, yeah. eh? Yeah, her stomach went through some stuff. <laughs> yeah, taking a modium, lady. God damn. <laughs> <laughs> I think, too, just in terms of, like, reframing kind of, you know, American frontier stories, it mm-hmm. was just really really cool and it's so fascinating to me that it takes place in a very specific time and place but that like we never actually know the date or really any proper nouns at all and that's totally fine you don't have to you know it never stops moving I mean yes I did say at the top of the show like I don't really care if anything happens or not but at the same time like she does this balancing act right this higher wire act where it's like you're in this girl's head and you were deep in this girl's head and sometimes she's sitting like next to a rock and we don't know how long she's sitting next to the rock. And yet it feels like this is a really propulsive narrative. And that's really hard to do, right? It's a it's a vibes book disguised as a plot book. It yes. is, which yeah. is why yes. we all love it. That's so <laughs> yeah, funny. Yeah. We had we had gotten a call or a uh, listener voicemail for that one where she was like she said she couldn't put the book down until she knew the girl was safe each night. Like she couldn't go yeah. to sleep. <laughs> I just loved it because it is like that level of like, OK, we can all take a breather and then we're going to keep going tomorrow. <laughs> um, OK, so, Andrew, what is another what is another one of your faves from the year? 
Um, another book uh, I, I really enjoyed is uh, is by Matthew Desmond. It's called Poverty by America. Um, Desmond is a sociologist. This book is like a, I guess like an argument book. I think it's fair to say it's a nonfiction book arguing about why poverty exists um, in the states. And and you know, to put it sort of dumbly in my language here. Um, it's essentially because like we we let it happen because we want it to happen because there are people who uh, live and exist above the poverty line that directly benefit from other people existing beneath the poverty line, um, and it's it's really it's it's a really uncomfortable read um, because there's a way to say like oh we're all responsible for X thing that is in a way dismissive right if we're all responsible for you know climate change or whatever it kind of means that none of us is and it just happens whatever but when when in this book when he's talking about like we are responsible for poverty it's talking specifically to like me and him Mm. right and everyone who has a retirement account and everyone i was especially thinking about this um because like i just had a kid and i was like filling out the 529 like college investment form or whatever the hell that is yeah um and i was like oh okay so like in order for this lump of money to do well for for my kid neighbors of mine have to you know be poor like that's just how it how it works um and and yeah that's not a great feeling but mm-hmm. i think it's it's a necessary one to be aware of mm-hmm. and he's also really i think he he's he's obviously noted as a sociologist um i think he's also a particularly efficient stylist mm-hmm. when it comes to writing mm-hmm. like i think his writing skills are kind of under valued in yeah. the way that people talk about this book you know there's like oh mm-hmm. all these numbers and all the argument da, da, da. he's just like really good at at writing this stuff in a, in a very clear and a direct way mm-hmm. Yeah, I was really excited, actually, that Andrew chose it. <laughs> and I was like, now I get to riff on this one. Um, I, I absolutely, the style thing is huge. I mean, essentially, Matt was sort of challenged by his editor to write this as if he were talking to someone in a bar and explaining why we're so broken. That's amazing. And I think that's a hugely important point to make because there are going to be so many people who look at the title and go, yeah, no. This is not like being stuck next to the relative at the dinner table where you're like, okay. This is not that at all. (laughs) This is someone saying, hey, listen, we're broken. Help me figure out how to change it. And Mm. I'm just going to give you some information you didn't previously have. Okay, I'm sold. I don't read a lot of nonfiction in any given year, but y'all have inspired me. I should pick this one up, I think. I think so. I really okay. think so. Okay. Wait, can Deal. I can I add to the nonfiction for a second? Yeah, of course. I have a really wildly special book. And yes, it was a finalist for the National Book Award. So thank you, judges. I will totally own this. But Christina Sharp, Ordinary Notes. Mm-hmm. Mm. Okay, I live and die by post-its. That's not why I'm recommending this book. <laughs> but like some of these notes, it's 248 notes and it's mm. a beautifully packaged book. And some of the notes are like seven pages and some of them are three lines and came off a post-it note. And, you know, there's so much love and beauty in this book, and there's so much tenderness. And she is also writing about grief and where we are in America right now, which isn't always our best moment. But the way she does it, there are two ways to read this book, right? You can read straight through from page one to the end. You can totally do it that way. I've done it that way, too. You can also keep it sort of at arm's length Mm. and dip in and out because you don't actually need to read things in the order in which they appear Mm -hmm. in the book. And it's just, it's such a groovy way to be connected with stuff that's a little bigger than you. And she just has this connection to words and ideas and writing um, that is so elegant and smart and really, I don't want to say unput downable, but that kind of is the word I need. It really, there's so many different ways to engage with what she's talking about. Um, it's a really important book, but it's beautifully written. <laughs> you know, it's funny. I like that you added the, the the two ways of reading because I, I literally just, when you said it, I was like, oh yeah. And I like, like what reached over to my bookshelf because yeah, I do have a copy that is like bounced around. Yep. I sort of like, I kind of, I haven't, I don't even know if I've read everything. I've like, I like just like flip a page. If I've got like 10 minutes to kill before a meeting, yep. I'll just like flip to a note and be like, oh, da 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 da. And it's really. I, I almost said palate cleanser because, it, but it's mm. not that. But it's like a nice like reset of a moment to just sink into something for a hot mm-hmm. sec uh, and then go on with your day. Yeah. That's so interesting. I was about to use the word digestible for it too. I think you know those morsels. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's really interesting. Better than tweets, yeah. Oh come on! It's much much better. 
<laughs> well, I, there is actually a nonfiction pick on my list as well this year, which is The Country of the Blind by Andrew Lee. Oh, so good. Which so I think good. also, I think it speaks to that idea of writing as an act of connection. This mm-hmm. is, you know, Andrew has a really rare genetic eye disease um, and he's exploring the degeneration of his own vision, but it's also about so much more than that. I mean, it's about the history of blindness in the United States. I think it also more broadly is just a really interesting and beautiful and compassionate and curious exploration of disability, which if we all spend a second to think about it, you know, if we are all lucky enough to live long enough, we will experience some disability Mm -hmm. in our own lives. And, I think he just approaches his own changing vision with so much grace and it's just a phenomenal book. I loved it so, so, so much. He's amazing. This book is kind of a marvel. It really is. Like it it could have gone a million different ways and he's just like, I'm a guy and I'm going to tell you a story. Mm-hmm. And it happens. <laughs> yeah, he's walking around a lot, Andrew. <laughs> he is walking around right, a lot. Cool. <laughs> On the two read list. <laughs> I mean, I look at some of these books that we're talking about, right? And I, as I think about them, like I'm smarter mm, because I've yeah. read Matthew yeah. Desmond and Andrew Leland and Christina Sharp. The novels, I love the novels too. And yes, they may, but there's a kind of narrative nonfiction, right? Where it forces you out of your comfort zone to engage with the world in a way that you hadn't necessarily thought of before, right? And I love that. I mean, I think, you know, partly from my own, so I have a similar, even rarer genetic eye disease that hasn't progressed as quickly as Andrew's. So I will probably lose my sight eventually, but I don't know when. And so I think partly for me reading this book, it, the way I had always thought of my eye disease and, you know, of impending blindness is as a real like diminishment and like a closing in mm-hmm. of my world. And I think what was so exciting for me about this one is that it, Andrew, it's so expansive. Like that's mm-hmm. the word I kept going back to. And that's so exciting. You know, yeah. it's like, oh, there mm-hmm. is still, there's like a whole interesting weird world that is actually really gorgeous and w- will mean that I can live just as beautiful a life as I could have regardless, which is, you know, it's great. I'm thrilled. <laughs> I think too, as a culture and a society, we need to have conversations about disability and what that looks like. This is the exact moment in time where we need to be having these conversations. And I think Andrew is literally the guide for folks who may not have ever really thought about this or may have opinions about multiple kinds of disability. So why not? Why not just pick up this book and like hang out with this guy for a few hours and just... Like, he's good company. He's He's a a really good company. (laughs) Yeah, he is. (laughs) Okay, let's take a quick break, and then we will get to the rest of our lists. This podcast is free, and it's accessible to everyone, thanks to support from listeners like you. If you value this show, please consider supporting its production by donating to our home, KUOW. It only takes a minute to give, and you'll be helping to support the production of this podcast. Make a donation at KUOW.org or follow the link in the show notes. And thanks! Um, okay, so Andrew, what's your third pick? All right, um, I think this is this is probably my number one with a bullet book this year. Um, yeah, it is... It is uh, uh, Jillian and Mariko Tamaki's graphic novel Roaming. Mm-hmm. Um, it is a beautiful book about uh, three 19 year old women, like so at college age, who take a trip to New York. You know, it takes place in like 2009. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the title Roaming is a you know pun on like roaming charges, which <laughs> 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 you know, it's been a minute since I had to think about those guys. Uh-huh. Eh? <laughs> Um, and you know, it is, it is this, I, you know, I, I think I just, I also just like love teen shit. I love, you know, Dawson's (laughs) Creek. I love the OC, you know, you know, Felicity, I'm sort of medium on, um, but, uh, this book has this complicated thicket of like friendships and, and romantic relationships and balancing between like goody goodies and like slightly less goody goodies. And then are you interested in sex? Are you scared of sex? Are you scared that everyone else is making out except for you? All these insecurities that weigh on you when you're 19 and 
and you know and then all there's also the road trip aspect to it which is always great you know there's there's going your your first overnight trip as a semi adult mm. with no parents you're you know where you you can go to bars even though you're underage <laughs> and then you can encounter like creepy dudes who who then you know you don't know how to necessarily interface with or or you can make decisions you know around your friendships um it, it's all like scary and exciting and fresh and new and it's all it's it's just like a, a beautiful book that sits in my belly mm. <laughs> I also really liked the existential, like, because I think that's also so real when you're 19, right? Is like, and whether or not it and ends you up smoke mattering. Weed the first time, and you're just like, whoa. <laughs> that, but also like, what is my major, and what the hell am I even gonna do after this? Yeah, it's just uh-huh. so wide open, which is really exciting, but also can be really heavy. I think at that at that point in time, you know. Yeah, because at that point, it feels like it's set in stone. What you yes. decide yeah. then is definitely what you're going to... It's obviously what you're going to be doing yeah, for the rest no of your life. Yeah, you have no other choices ever yeah, again. Yeah, this is FC. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm definitely going to do well on the GREs, right? And not completely vomit, right? That's definitely going to be a thing. <laughs> also, the the first of uh, vomiting in a cab, I think, is also a really good one in that. You know, it's just like, oh, yeah. sometimes it happens. <laughs> yep. <laughs> um, okay, so Miwa, what's your third pick? So, with a caveat that... Um, I know I said I don't really do historical fiction and chose a historical fiction title. Mm. I also kind of don't do animal narrators, and I love this book. (laughs) I love this little novel. And it's like 150-something pages, and it's all voice. I mean, talk – all right, Andrew, you want a vibes novel? You want a Mm -hmm. vibe? This is – this is this year's vibes (laughs) novel. Oh, hell yeah. Open Throat by Henry Hoke. (laughs) And I read it. Obviously, very quickly, because tiny, tiny little thing, but there's no punctuation. The voice is everything. Yeah, it's an L.A. novel, but it's also not an L.A. novel. It's the kind of book that I have recommended to so many people by saying, I'm not going to tell you what it's about. Just start reading. What do you have against animal narrative? I, it's nothing <laughs> personal. Great question. It's nothing Andrew. personal. We it's are all yeah. animals. I just want to point out. I, yes. And I, I, okay, let me, let me. Be speci- Aslan, not my thing, right? Mm. Like the last okay, time I yeah. really grooved on an animal narrator, I was so nine. So Redwall was, was not up your alley? Oh, I was I a Stuart that. Little, age nine, Charlotte's <laughs> Web, and then I was good. <laughs> it's like, oh. okay. Uh, oh my I just, uh, you know, uh, we like what we like, and sometimes For we sure. can challenge ourselves to do something di- different, which I was able to do with Open Throat, <laughs> um, mostly, again, because of the voice. And the lack of punctuation was kind of fun for me in a way where I was like, huh, I didn't really notice there was no punctuation until I was done. And then I was going back to sort of noodle around. That's so funny. There's no punctuation because so I had just finished landscapes Mm -hmm. and I was looking for another audio book and you had sent over your list yesterday, Mila. And Mm -hmm. I was like, Oh, it's only a two hour audio book. Like, fuck it. I'll give it a shot. (laughs) I didn't notice that there was no punctuation. I finished it. It's I read it. You know, I finished it this morning. It was great. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to get too into plot, especially because it's so short, but I think what makes it stand out is it, it's from the point of view of a mountain lion that lives underneath the Hollywood sign. Yep. And it does a thing that is partly why I love sci-fi so much too, where like if you remove Earth or if your main characters aren't humans, it's actually an opportunity to say the most mm-hmm. about humanity. Mm-hmm. And I feel like this really, you know, there's like a earnestness, but it's still sardonic. The tone is really interesting it's super propulsive. I mean, stuff does happen. I would say it's kind of, it's pretty plotty too. And it's really charming and kind of haunting. I have a feeling I'm going to think about it a lot. I think it also speaks to where we are again with this, you know, we're all feeling a little funky. We're all feeling a little isolated. We're all Mm -hmm. feeling a little, you know, not quite. It's a weird moment, right? It's a weird moment to be us. It's a weird moment to be in the world and open throat for me, really captured that this year. Yeah, yeah. I'm stuck on Miwa reading like Animorphs, so then when they turn into animals, like throwing it out. Like, this sucks. <laughs> <laughs> then oh like waiting God. until they turn human again. It's like, all right, I'm back. <laughs> oh, Animorphs was you know, so good. <laughs> I have to say, I missed Animorphs. Oh, yeah. So, oh, uh-huh. so sorry. I do think but that yeah. was a very specific period of time. <laughs> yeah. For those um, and it was 1995. <laughs> yeah. And if you happened and, to be 10, it was perfect. Yeah, they hit, dude. And, and I can say I was not. 
So yeah. <laughs> I was I was getting into other kinds of trouble that didn't involve animorphs. <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> So my third pick is also a Nerdette Book Club pick, so I don't have to rave about it for too long, but it is The Adventures of Amina Al-Sarafi by mm-hmm. Shannon Chakraborty. Uh, it's uh-huh. just so much fun. I mean, it's completely escapist. When we had her on the show, she talked about how really she wrote something that it was like, I want to get the hell out of the pandemic. How do I get mm-hmm. as far away from this mm-hmm. yeah, great situation way, as yeah. possible? Oh, thank you. But yeah, she, I don't know. I just think like, for one, how many books have you read from the point of view of a like middle-aged Muslim lady pirate? Like even that I find to be so refreshing and exciting, but it also just has all of these wonderful mythological elements and is such a wild ride. And I think too, you know, also what she talked about in her interview is the idea that like, this isn't the novel about the forming of the crew. This is the novel that takes place like 25 years later and is about getting the crew back together, which also is just so much fun. I think there's a real like it's the ocean's 11 of that. Of- exactly. <laughs> it yeah. is of like it 12th is. century pirate yeah. novels. Which uh-huh. like, yes, of course that's what we need in our lives. <laughs> Also, for a not tiny book, it flies. Yes. Again, like I just did not want to stop. Absolutely mm. did not want to stop. And I was yeah. just like, okay, pirates are not usually my thing, but I want more of this, please. <laughs> it yeah. was great. Yeah. Was Turns so out, love a lady pirate. Like, not yeah. mad about it uh-huh. ever. Uh-huh. <laughs> Andrew, is that one that you would pick up? Oh, I... So not normally, to, mm. like to be completely honest. Sure. But then, like ha- having listened to that interview and just like I was like, oh, I I love a like a one more job, yeah, you know, type yeah. story, caper that, flicks. It's yes. a caper, f- like yeah, it's yeah. a caper flick, yeah. Only you know with pirates, it's a romp. I also love you know the the main character. She's Muslim and so her faith sort of like wavers. You know, she's like there are times when she's more faithful than others, but like she has this caveat where like she still wants to have sex with, with beautiful people, but as long as she gets married first, she can always divorce them later. And it's just like such a great, it's, I don't know. I just thought it was really fun. And that's girl math for you. Right. <laughs> hey, you know, it's about time. Super religious girl math. Hey, man, yeah. like, however it goes. Right. <laughs> Listen, if you um, really want to get married, do what you need to do. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay, so I know I was extremely stringent in limiting each of you to only three titles. Are there like, I don't know, a dozen more that you want to just yell out really fast? No, just kidding. But is there, I don't know, like even one or two that you would love to say this deserves its time in the sun? Yeah, I think Chain Gang All-Stars, mm. Nana Kwame Ajay Brenya's yeah. novel. I mean... There's so much love in that book. There's so there much is. love and there's so much. <sighs> yeah, you know what? I'm just going to stick to love. That It's a really important book. It's a really, really important book. And I think, you know, we've got to find our joy where we can and we've got to find our connection where we can. And that, oof, that's, that's the one where it's like, oh, right. This is what it means to be human. It's complicated. It's messy. We're not always good at it. But sometimes the love wins out and that gets you through Mm -hmm. and love, you know, love can be hard, right? Like I know we've got Hallmark and life, you know, lifetime and all of these folks trying to tell us that this is the thing we aspire to, but love can actually be really hard Mm -hmm. to do. And um, it's one that I've given a lot of copies to people um, and will continue to give copies of to people. So that, that would be the one that I would add if we'd, if we'd had four. Yeah, that's a good, yeah. that's a good must read for sure. What do you think, Andrew? Um, I'll shout out um, Ringmaster by Abraham Josephine Reisman. It is a biography of Vince McMahon. Um, <laughs> wow. I think I'm, I was never like a wrestling person. You know, Vince McMahon is the head of the WWE. I was never a wrestling person growing up. Um, but I, I think I often get lost in the sauce of irony And is this person being serious or is this thing like a bit? Is this like how? And I I think the perfect encapsulation of that is the WWE because it's the the (laughs) idioms of wrestling, right? Of of heels and baby faces. Is this real? Is this scripted? And I think it's, it's a useful tool to like look at the rest of the world through that prism, Mm -hmm. right? As to like who is acting and who isn't and does that matter? Um, And so who, who's a baby face and who's a heel, you know? <laughs> okay, that's a total trip. That is a total trip, all of what you just said. And yet, you are so right. Because also, if you think about how much cultural currency the uh-huh. WWE has had over the years, yeah. and also, like, mm-hmm. The Rock 
hello, you yeah. know, I mean, <laughs> Dwayne Johnson, president, start, you know, like, it was, yeah. uh, like yeah. all oh, of it. It's wow. kind of like, huh? Okay. Fascinating. That's wild. That's a good one. I would love to shout out a book that came out pretty recently called same bed, different dreams, which <gasps> is it's by Ed Park. It's not short, but it is phenomenal. Like I still am not sure how he pulled off what he pulled off, but that was such a pleasure to read. It was phenomenal. So yeah, looking ahead to 2024, um, are there any titles in particular that you're super excited to, for people to get to read if you already have, or for you to get your grubby little fingers on? <laughs> yeah. Um, I think I'll start the, um, I am on a uh, Percival Everett kick right now. <sighs> um, I'm yeah, I, I finished like Dr. No last week. Um, I'm finishing up erasure. I'm on tomorrow. I think I'm going to go to a screening of American fiction. Uh, um, so, I would then, love to hear what you think of that one. It's amazing. Have you seen it? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I, can't yeah. I, cannot, I can't wait to see it. I can't wait to see it. We'll get um, the group text going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah, so next year he's coming out with James, mm-hmm. um, which is a, a retelling uh, of, of Huck Finn, uh, you know, from, from Jim's point of view. I actually read Huck Finn. I have a, I haven't touched, I have a copy of James, but I haven't touched it yet because I wanted to read Huck Finn again, you know, revisit mm-hmm. Huck Finn first. Mm-hmm. And so I'm, I'm really curious to see where this book takes him. Cool. I am so excited, Andrew, that you picked that book because now I can add a second. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, no, I'm, I have read James. I love this book. I love every word in this book. Mm. And it's just, I cannot wait for this book to hit. Um, I will say the first time I read it, I had not reread Huck Finn. I'm not sure I'm going to reread Huck Finn. I'm not entirely like, I really actually think James is going to stand on its own. That's and cool. I think, and I think Mark Twain's stuff has become enough of sort of American mythology that I'm like, mm, yeah, I'm good. Thanks. Yeah. Um, we'll see if I change my mind. Um, Fair enough. I might. Most of it's it pretty good. It doesn't Most come out is. until March. It doesn't yeah. come out until March. <laughs> you have to end um, on the side. But also Tommy Orange, Wandering mm. Stars. Yep. Mm-hmm. Oh, oh, this book. This, I mean, I loved They're There because it's this amazing kinetic sort of, it feels like an L.A. crime novel, even though it's like set in the Bay Area. <laughs> yeah. But it has that kinetic energy, right? That mm. kind of like that snap and that swing to it. Um, and Wandering Stars is, yeah. Oh, good. It's a heater, yeah. It's, it's, I want everyone to read this book. That's exciting. I'm really excited about the new Kylie Reed, which comes out in January. Yep. Yep. That's one super fun that I have had the galley of it for months and I'm saving it. And I don't even know what that means. The t- I'll know the time when it comes, but it's just like, I know I'm going to mm-hmm. be so happy that I have it and can read it. And it'll, I think the time will be soon, but it hasn't happened yet. <laughs> Well, oh my gosh, you too. This was so much fun. Thank you both very, very much for coming on. I loved it. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thank you. This was great. Can we do it again? Yes, please. Yes, please. Our roundup of the best books of the year would not be complete without you, our listeners. So here are some of the best books that you all read this year. Hi, Nadette. Jessie from New Zealand here. My favorite book of 2023 is V.E. Schwab's Fragile Threads of Power. I have twin toddlers, so I don't get to read a lot right now, but I absolutely devoured this book as soon as I heard about it through Nerdette. And it was just so fun to step back into this world and follow the intrigue of all these fascinating characters. I can't wait to see where our honorary Nerdette V.E. Schwab takes it next. This is Linda from Nassau, Bahamas. My favorite book of 2023 is Shrines of Gaiety by Kate Atkinson. It's about a female club owner in 1920s London, and it is gripping. Cannot recommend it highly enough. Hi, Nerdette. This is Betsy. Favorite book, Land of Milk and Honey by C. Pam Zhang. Thanks. Hey, this is Nerdette's producer Anna in Chicago, and one of my favorite books this year was In the Lives of Puppets by TJ Klune. This book is so sweet. It's kind of like Heartstopper on Netflix, but it's a sci-fi fantasy retelling of Pinocchio with robots. It's a queer love story, and it's going to make you feel so many things. It's so good. Hi, Nerdette. This is Allie in Germany. And one book that I enjoyed this year was Monsters, A Fan's Dilemma by Claire Detterer. 
It's a book of essays exploring the monstrous male artists that have been famous throughout time and what to do with art that was made by someone who has done something horrible. Um, and I just thought it was very thoughtful and thought provoking and yeah, highly recommend. Really good read. Hi, Nerda. This is Ava from Peoria, Illinois. For me, it has to be Black River Orchard by Chuck Wendig. I have loved everything of his that I have read, and this book had it all for me. The dark magic fuel fueled by apples, and there was family drama and community drama was just great. And I also loved the interview you had the author, so I'd recommend anyone listen to that if they are on the fence about this book. I cannot wait to hear what everyone else's favorite books are. Thanks. Thank you so much to Jesse, Linda, Betsy, Allie, and Ava for calling in. Hearing from y'all is by far like one of the most delightful parts of the show. So I really appreciate you. And if you still want to chime in about some of the other topics we are covering, it is not too late. We are still going to be talking about the best podcasts and TV shows of the year. So record your little voice memos on your little smartphones and then send us your pics to nerdatpodcast at gmail.com. Nerdette is produced by me and Anna Bauman at WBEZ Chicago. We are part of the NPR network. Bianca Cheka created a beautiful webpage for this episode. You should definitely check that out. And Brendan Banizak is our executive producer. We will see you next week. That was an episode from our friends at Nerdette. They have a new episode each week and you can find many more wherever you get your podcasts. We'll be back on Thursday with an entire episode of Text Me Back dedicated to the Lord of the Rings, including our very first guest on our show. See you then, Melon.